I uh, appreciate everybody coming, and we're very pleased tonight to have Robert Wilder of Brookfield uh, doing a program in the geological changes of New England, and it's all yours, Bob. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, and welcome. We'll try to get you out of here by time. Time the baseball game starts. But he personally got, got, got ex extended, so we'll probably be in time no matter what I do. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back. I'll quote the references. We're going to go back about three billion years. Some of you here were probably around then, but <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> I'm going to take you step by step all the way through until the last ice ages. And uh, then I'll uh, spend the last 15 minutes introducing you to a Russian uh, who uh, wrote wonderful books and uh, gave us an awful lot of information on the events that occurred in the world that were catastrophic in nature. So with that, I'll start with the first uh, display. My helper here, you'll see him from time to time, uh, Ben Blair. He's, uh, he's going to manage some of my map boards for me. It's going to be hard for you to see these, so if anybody's interested after the fact, Now, George, uh, John Rogers from the uh, uh, University of North Carolina did a study, went over several years, and what he did was he went around the earth and he took cratons, and for the use who do not know what a craton is, it's a core from ancient rocks. And he took these core samples all over the world, dated them, and then took the oldest and traveled around the world or his... Uh, his uh, acquaintances, friends did, and they took core samplings and ran a comparison. And it's terribly interesting what happened. His oldest rocks were three billion years old. So that's basically telling us that's when the first rocks and land appeared above, above the surface of the ocean. So they, uh, they named these continents, and they called that one Ur. You are the first. Two and a half million years ago, another continent appeared. This, his cratons tell him that. And they call that uh, Arctica, and that's shown in orange here. <clears throat> Two billion years ago, Baltica and a a Atlanta, Atlantica. That's, that's the, the uh, uh, sort of a lilac and yellow. <clears throat> At any rate, one billion years ago, all of these formed into a single continent. That's on display down here. It was called Rodina. Now it's the interesting part about this. When they examined these cratons and went around the world to find out where those rocks came from and where they originally were, lo and behold, they discovered Arctica was actually in northern Canada, Baffin Island, Greenland, and a large part of Siberia. Those at all at one time were all joined together. The second one was Ur. Now, Ur is the oldest uh, rock on Earth. That shows up on the western, northwestern coast of Australia. It shows up all of India, uh, Madagascar, and the eastern, southeastern coast of Africa. <coughs> Baltica, that's the one in, uh, that's purple. That shows up as uh, the Ukraine. Norway, Sweden, and uh, parts of Poland. And then finally, Atlantica. That shows up in the, in the western part of Africa. You can see it in yellow here, but it's also the almost entire uh, east coast of South America. So at one point in time, all these things were together. And now, over a period of time, it spread out and moved around. And as a result, <coughs> we have this configuration. Sometimes I wrestle with these things, <laughs> and the signboard wins. Uh, we're going to switch over to here. We're going to wait two million years ago. 
we had that single continent. Please note that Asia and Europe are in this section. Greenland is sandwiched between there and North America. Africa is hard against the New England coast. I'll tell you more about that later. South America is, is uh, against the southern coast of North America and uh, it's one with Africa. Madagascar is also one with Africa and India. Arabia is a part or a peninsula extending off the eastern part of uh, Africa. Antarctica, surprisingly enough, is north of Australia, and Australia is the southernmost uh, continent. Now, 100 million years ago, these plates begin to separate and move, and I'll talk more about them later. They begin to move. Pangaea, which is a single continent, begins to break up. You begin to see something that looks somewhat like what we have on the globe today. Asia is beginning to look like Asia. Europe, but you'll notice, you'll notice a connection between Europe and Arabia. You'll notice also that India, the plate India is attached to, is beginning to move north. Antarctica still has to move to the south, and Australia has to move to the east. North and South America have actually two connections. One will one day become Mexico um, and the Gulf of Mexico. The other is Florida, and it will break away. Part of it will become Cuba and some of the islands just north of South America. So the end result is you end up with a, a map that looks like what we have today. This is a short version, so you'll make the ball game. Ben? <laughs> map in mind, uh, focusing on New England because I tried to do all of the United States, we'd be here till next Friday. I show Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, eastern part of New York, Long Island, Connecticut, Rhode Island. This green represents Canada, but this plays no part in, in the discussion we would have. million years before the present, Lake Cambrian area, you're looking, you can see where we are. We're in the deep sea, we're a thousand feet or deeper under the sea at this point where we live. The only land that you find in New England or eastern New York Strait is a small desert up in the corner here, would be an island, and you can see part of the mountain chain, the Piedmont Mountains that are here. Along the east coast, these orange circles are nothing but a background for the volcanoes. Many, many volcanoes. It just wasn't seven volcanoes. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volcanoes along that fault line. Now we moved to 415 million years ago in late Solarium. <coughs> Merrimack Trough runs right through a uh, section of New England. This is deep sea. It's a thousand feet or more in depth. Shallow seas are the ones with the hash marks on it. That's moderate seas. That runs uh, uh, approximately 500 feet to 1,000 feet. Then the shallow or offshore, the light blue, and then you run into a desert. Eastern New York and from the Piedmont Mount, uh, Piedmont uh, from the Berkshires west, uh, it's desert. And you'll notice the, uh, the mountains up here now? That's because something is pushing against, a plate is pushing against the uh, eastern coast of what will later become New England. Now we also have these same volcanoes, but look up here near the top of Maine, with the western uh, border of Maine. Notice that a great number of volcanoes begin to appear there. The 
It's 300 million years ago in mid Pennsylvania era. Now we still have the Merrimack Trough. We still have the desert, the shallow seas. We're beginning to develop more and more volcanoes. Notice they now uh, cover the uh, southern part of Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, up to central Connecticut, and through the Berkshire Mountains. And another interesting phenomenon, an island appears where Nashville, New Hampshire is located and where Boston, Massachusetts is. So this is basically uh, from uh, the western Massachusetts border east. That is primarily uh, the only land as such short of uh, volcano tips coming out of the sea. <clears throat> 200 million years ago, the late Triassic. You'll notice now the volcanic action is, is, is abating. We still have volcanic action, new action. It's running up along the eastern New Hampshire border section of Maine. Also, we've got a new set of mountains that have developed through eastern Massachusetts and another set of mountains that are developing through here. <coughs> uh, a huge desert reaches up from New York City and crosses over into Long Island. And in that desert is a huge sea. This is an enormous sea. Later on, that sea becomes Lake Hitchcock, which is through Massachusetts up into New Hampshire. That was an enormous lake that uh, was pretty close to where the town boundaries are located now. This is an interesting period of time because 230 million years ago, the first dinosaurs on Earth appeared. They appeared in New Mexico and Massachusetts. They find evidence of them uh, all through Hadley in that area. Dinosaur tracks show up in the rocks there in great numbers. They even had a museum there for a great number of years, so you could go up and see them. Uh, New Mexico, they found 40 of them in one place. It was called the dog dinosaur. It was no bigger than a Great Dane, but it had a long snout and plenty of sharp teeth and date meat. on Earth and the effect that it's beginning to have on the continents is still it's work in work right now so uh, it's in play we have, presently have a plate that's pushing all of the uh, West, uh, Western Hemisphere continents in one direction is pushing up against uh, uh, Russia in another direction there's another one pressing up in a, in, a, in a different direction and it's causing all these continents to move and the surprising part is what they're going to look like 250 million years in the future, they're back to a single continent again when Australia and uh, Antarctica are finally reach, and these plates are pushing, so they'll get there eventually. And then the Atlantic Ocean will become an inland sea. We'll have a huge donut shaped continent, and everywhere where these continents collided will be huge mountains, ranges of mountains. That's what this uh, uh, black line represents. Seventy-five thousand years ago, some interesting stuff happened, and I'm going to talk to you more about that later. Seventy-five million years ago, you notice the Arctic Ocean? It's blue. It had melted. Seventy-five thousand years ago, there's a reason. I'll get to that. As it melted, all of the land that was above the waterline, as shown in white, has now submerged. Only the ones you see in color actually remained above the waterline. You see Africa is a series of islands. Europe is nothing but islands. Asia is a, a large island and two smaller ones. And look at North America. We're broken up into four different islands with a large expanse or a large sea that runs up through the Great Lake area. And this is the last one. 
Not much to look at here. <coughs> so you won't get lost. The light won't go on. Would you believe that? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there. So you won't get lost. Here we are. I like that a lot of times, just a big blank. <laughs> but anyway, that represents our, our immediate area here. 17 to 18,000 years ago, and this now, this is argu argumentative because now they found evidence that it may have been 5,000 years later. It may have been 10, 12,000 years when the glacier was in this position. This is the direction of the glacier. Now the glacier is moving. We're going to move this up. We can see a little more here. 16,000 years ago, uh, and I'm going to stay with my numbers until uh, something else is proven, you begin to see a little bit of southwestern Connecticut and Long Island and around New York City. You'll also see just a section of the uh, Cape. 15,000 years ago, We can see the southern part of Connecticut, Rhode Island, a big part of the Cape, all of Long Island, a little bit of uh, eastern New York. Fourteen thousand five hundred years ago, it begins to turn into tundra through central Connecticut, central Rhode Island, and uh, uh, most of the Cape, from certainly from the canal on down to Provincetown. Fourteen thousand years, beginning to move still further, but we're still, we're still in the snow. Thirteen thousand five hundred years ago, we're finally out of the snow. This is tundra. It brings the animals. It brings uh, mammoths and and, and uh, uh, great bison, bison and a whole variety of animals such as that that will graze on the tundra. It also brings something else. It brings people. It brings the paleo Indians from the west. Evidence of them has been found up in Cape Ann and down in my area in Aquabin, in Enfield and in uh, Greenwich has found uh, paleo artifacts and a few others have shown up since then. <clears throat> 13,200 years, you can see the glaciers melting rapidly. We're done looking at that. A little ahead of schedule, you're still going to make the ball game. Sir. <laughs> now I want to introduce you to uh, uh, another gentleman. He, he came to America from Russia. He was a he was a, a great geologist and a great author. He wrote Worlds in Collision. If you have, somebody's read it. If you've read it, uh, it, it's truly enlightening. It's unbelievable the things he produced. Then five years later, he wrote Earth and Upheaval. If you haven't read this, you, there isn't a day the rest of your life will pass after you read this, you don't think about this and look around you and realize what he has found, the evidence he collected in the Earth to tell the catac cataclysmic events that occur on this Earth in this country and otherwise. It's Emmanuel Velikovsky. I'll quote him frequently in the next uh, uh, several minutes. But before I do, uh, I was talking to the president of the Historical Society here, and I said I'm going to talk about the hills in North Brookfield, all these little bumps you see. Uh, you see that in, in Marks Mountain and Warren, you see Foster Hill and West Brookfield. All of the mountains we have here are just bumps. They don't look like the Rockies at all. When I was going to school, they, they taught us that the glaciers came across here and they plowed off the top of the mountain. I'm sure most of you learned that in school. But that always troubled me. Matter of fact, it got me on, on this uh, uh, path to try and understand what happened. Because all over the world, you could see glaciers, and the glaciers were winding their way through mountains and weren't plowing the tops off them at all. As a matter of fact, the thousand foot high glacier barely went a quarter of the way up so that many of these mountains. So it couldn't do any time. Something else, some of the forces came to pass that 
flipped off the top of those mountains. Well, let me give you a clue. Bill Dickinson and George Urell from the University of Arizona, they did a study. Uh, a writer for the Discover magazine, uh, Jocelyn Selim, uh, abridged their study and wrote it in such a fashion that you could get all the information and we didn't get all of the details. And then I had to abridge it further so that I wouldn't keep you here past the end of the ball game. <laughs> That's funny. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> so here's the abridged what happened to the Appalachian Mountains. That the Grand Canyon has a fancy East Coast prodigy. Predi prodigy. See that? Uh -huh. Pedigree. Pedigree. She pedigree. spelled it wrong. There it is. <laughs> it's a pedigree. Uh, their research explains both the origin of Arizona's colorful gorge and the fate of the Appalachian Mountains. It's an eastern mountain chain that once was as mighty as the Rockies. <clears throat> Most geologists believe that the rocks of the Colorado Plateau surrounding the Grand Canyon originated in a mountain range that ran from Mexico to Colorado, and that it had eroded uh, anywhere from 300 to 150 million years ago <coughs> and solidified into Arizona's sedimentary rocks. These two uh, geologists used uh, a new method. It's called uranium lead dating and they took hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of samples of rocks and sand grains and what have you from all over the country, plus the uh, uh, Grand Canyon and uh, the Arizona Plain, Colorado Plain. And what they found uh, reveals a completely different history than what we had been taught. They found that about half of the samples taken out of the Colorado Plateau originated 1.2 billion years ago to 500 million years ago in the Appalachian Mountains. It was carried west by huge amounts of water. Now, you think about huge amounts of water, what could that possibly be? Only a huge amount is a tsunami or an enormous tidal wave. This analysis re reveals an unknown era in North American history when mighty waters tore down the towering mountains of the east and carried debris west to build the layers that one can observe in the canyon today. And the best picture I could get of the canyon is here, but it's, it's amazing to see the sedimentary rock and the numbers of layers. I'll leave this up here. I'm sorry I don't have a bigger picture to show you, but the number of layers that built up over a period of years. Now, Golikowski, bless him, he says, you know, how do we explain tropical forests and atolls from uh, equatorial areas. Uh, how do we explain mammoths in the Arctic Circle? How did they get up there? How did we get palm trees in Spitsbergen? How did they get there? Equatorial plants are also found in Antarctica. Well, let me tell you how, what he figured out. In Alaska, where the Tanana River meets the Yukon in the 1920s, prospectors were up there digging for gold. And they found this huge trench, a huge, massive amount of what they call muck. And in that muck, they found the bones of mammoths and mastodons, super bison, horses, full-size horses and camels that used to exist in North America. Uh, Glypodons, those are huge, huge, eight-foot long armadillo-type creatures, and three-toed sloths. All of these things are now ex extinct. And you're saying, what are these animals, the bones, the bones actually were fractured bones buried in the muck, but they weren't fossilized. These things were bones as if they had just been broken. They found flesh, they found hair, they found all of this in, in, this, in these uh, huge ditches. So you wonder, how did all these animals from North America end up in Africa uh, and Alaska? How did they end up there? Well, let, let me liken this to if you go to the beach and you see the ocean coming in, the tide coming in, then it sucks and backs away. It leaves debris, does it not? Every time it comes, it adds more to this debris. Well, Golikovsky says, enormous tidal waves swept across North America and made many, many of the animals extinct. He, he goes further than that, and I'll get to that a little later. But he says, what created the tidal wave so great that, that the... Uh, 
the levels of the ocean might drop 500 feet. And then he gets into Venus. Venus is a visitor from out of space, not from our uh, uh, not from our vicinity. It's not, it is not a permanent part of, of uh, our collection of planets. As a matter of fact, it may not even be a planet. And it came through, and, and all planets have this magnetic uh, field. Uh, it has this magnetic field. And you know, positive and, and negatives attract with magnets. <laughs> At any rate, he claims, and he produced sufficient evidence to probably support this, he claimed that Venus interrupted the, came into this uh, uh, universe, interrupted uh, Mars' orbit, and actually caused Mars and itself to move into the vicinity of the Earth. And the magnetic fields caused the outer skin, the outer skin, which is 10 miles thick, riding on 8,000 ball of melted magma, caused it to shift. It caused the poles to move. Now, residual magnetism in the, in the rocks show that at least four times in the history of the Earth, the poles have shifted. And one time, they actually reversed. And scientists said as early as today, I read in the paper where the 13 degree shift in the poles from the last 300 years, in 20,000 years, the North Pole will be situated where the South Pole is today. I, I don't know how uh, uh, authentic that is, but that's what they're claiming. Now, to support this, Velikovsky says wolves in uh, Siberia were found eating fresh meat. They investigated the fresh meat and they found out that these were mammoths that had been dead for thousands and thousands of years. But the meat was still as fresh as if the animal had just died. Furthermore, they discovered the animal had all of its organs, all of its hair, all of its skin. Its stomach was full. Its intestines were full from a digested meal. Its mouth still had food in it that it had just grazed upon. Eyeballs were intact. How could an animal uh, be found in this cold climate in that condition? Because when an animal falls down and dies, it begins to certainly begins to deteriorate immediately. This didn't happen. And the only way you could get an animal in this position and preserve him for tens of thousands of years is to flash freeze him. Now, if Belikovsky is right, and his skin slid and the poles moved, then he went from a tundra area into a freezing area in a split second. That would flash freeze him, wouldn't it? That would explain this. Now, if anybody has a better explanation, please tell me at the end, because uh, he or I or anybody that I know of can find it. Now, he quotes the Earth as being, say it's the size of a basketball. A layer of paper over the top of it would be the uh, magma, mantle that we live on. The rest is magma. So there's 8,000 miles through of, of uh, molten lava. There's only 10 miles, 10 miles of uh, the mantle that we live on. So it's, it's rather insignificant. And any fractures in the tectonic plates, you can see why we're going to have volcanoes and why the ring of fire exists in the Pacific and so forth. However, and, and this globe fortunately shows it, From Greenland to Antarctica is a mid-Atlantic ridge. Now this ridge has been spreading about an inch a year for millions of years. Lava comes up through and it solidifies. And you remember Africa I told you was up against the coast of New England? And if I didn't, I should have. But it's been moving, moving away gradually, an inch at a time through millions of years. Now as this uh, mid-Atlantic ridge opens up and causes the two continents to move away, the Earth doesn't grow in diameter. So that, that material has to go somewhere. So you look to the Pacific, and they, they have a, a, what's called a Mariana Trench. It stretches down from the Sea of Japan and runs down along the, uh, the east coast of China and down into Indonesia. And another one meets that and runs south, uh, west of uh, Australia and down to Antarctica. And where the mid-Atlantic 
ridge expanded, the Mar Mariana Trench folded. And it's actually a fold that's now seven miles deep. Now think about that. It's only three miles from breaking through to the, to the uh, molten material below. Now that trench, that trench expels 300 billion tons of CO2, carbon dioxide. This is the thing that this global warming fetish that this is happening and, and, and we're responsible and all the things that go with it. Well, 300 billion tons is expelled from the Mariana Trench. Now, all of it doesn't get out. The, the water, the oceans absorb some of it. There's a Kyoto Treaty the UN is pushing and they're focusing on the industrial nations. That's us. That's us and, 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 and Britain and, and, the, and the European countries, Japan. And they're focusing on us. We make combined seven to eight billion tons of CO2 a year. Now think of that. Now, the thing about this treaty is it excludes the developing nations. The developing nations include China and India. Now listen to these numbers. It's estimated that India, with its one billion people, uh, produces 300 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide a year. China, with its 1,400,000 people, and they're putting a new power plant online every week, and it's coal burning, and they will be for decades, produce 500 billion tons a year. Now, us with our measly 7 to 8 billion uh, tons a year are asked to try to cut that to, to, to the very bare minimum, and in order to do that, we will become uh, another great nation because our industries will suffer. Everything about this country will suffer. But these people are still excluded because they're developing. Now think of that. I think why there's so much pressure not to, not to sign the, the treaty. Now, I'm going to go through uh, two more things here. Threats to the earth. Threats that are presently uh, uh, threatening the survival of uh, flora and fauna on the earth. The Canary Islands, which are um, just the west and south of Gibraltar, uh, there's a La Palma Island on that, and La Palma Island has a super volcano located on that. The west, the east wall failed thousands of years ago, and it may have sealed off the uh, uh, straits of Gibraltar and caused the Mediterranean to begin to drop, and it could have been the uh, genesis for uh, North Africa becoming a desert. Now the west, the caldera is growing. That's the, the huge rock dome that covers the magma the inside of that volcano, and it's growing. It's it's coming under enormous pressure and growing. It's large. This is a super volcano. It's estimated that when that west wall collapses, a huge tidal wave over 200 feet high, will race across the Atlantic Ocean westward at the speed of a 747, more than 600 miles an hour, and wash up against the coast of all of North America and all of South America. And it won't just be a single wave, there'll be a series of these waves. Uh, so you can see, and he says the Atlantic may drop as much as 500 feet to replenish this wave to keep this thing going. Uh, don't worry about it. Your grandchildren will have to worry about it. We're looking into the future, a long ways into the you future, hopefully. Yes, now, now we have, the, we have the, uh, the worst threat on Earth that exists today, and that's right here at home. And Yellowstone Park is a time bomb. It sets on a 50-mile 50 50 mile diameter caldera. It's building up. You can tell that the magma is close to the surface. You see all the geysers, all the various other heat activities, warm springs and so forth. <clears throat> it's a super volcano. It's probably the rarest and most terrible threat on the Earth today. He says, when lava bursts through this mantle, destruction of all flora and fauna on Earth can and maybe will occur. 74,000 years ago, remember I showed you the map and said, remember that? Sumatra had a similar occurrence, and it contaminated the atmosphere so badly for so many years that the biggest part of the animal life on Earth was killed. And he goes on to say the estimated population of Neanderthals and uh, Cro-Magnons, which were our ancestors, 
were in the tens of thousands. And by the time that the, the sun uh, peered through this debris, we were down to the thousands in numbers. And yeah, told you to get out of here and type it again. <laughs> Boston. <laughs> to I can tell you're a fan. Uh, yeah, I can tell you're a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Boston. Uh, there were two excellent uh, geologists, R.A. Daly and Brooks, wrote Our Mobile Earth and Climate Through the Ages. And I'm going to quote what they have to say. Now remember, this is close to home, and this is going to be my finale. It says, Boston. It rests on the surface of one of the Earth's greatest mountain chains. Boston lay in the equatorial rain zone during the Carbon Carboniferous period, and in the region of hot deserts during the Permian period. The oldest desert in the world sits under Boston. Furthermore, the site of Boston was once under the sea. It was once also under a mile-thick cap of ice. Now this is not the effects of processes that are present in our time. The highest mountains becoming flat, equatorial jungles giving place to hot desert sands, from hot deserts to polar covers of ice, from the polar cover of ice to the bottom of the sea, from the sea bottom to the site of Harvard University, due to cataclysmic uh, evolutions, not natural events. That's quite a series of events that occurred right there in, uh, in Boston area. Okay, I've gone through it. I sped it up. Everybody's going to make their ball game, and I am too. <laughs> uh, anybody has any questions or anything you would like to see over? Yes. Brother Will Early has a theory. Uh, are you familiar with his position? No, not at all. Okay. He has written a rather scholarly thought regarding global warming, and he says for every ounce of carbon monoxide or what that's generated, water is generated. He, he, it just, he exposed me to the thought recently. And mm -hmm. You might want to talk with him. Yeah, I'd be glad to. I didn't know that. I didn't know he, he was He's strong on it. He's got the credentials, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what his background was. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yes, I will chat with him about yeah. that. I know that. I know that we're having a problem with the oceans warming, but it probably doesn't have anything to do with carbon dioxide. The ocean is probably warming from the heat coming through the mantle with... with uh, uh, changes, geological changes occurring, and when that happens, the oceans do not absorb as much of the CO2 that's coming out of the Mariana Trench, and therefore more will escape. And it's certainly going to contribute a great deal more to global warming than anything the people in developing countries could possibly do. Sir? Hasn't that Mariana Trench been around for a few million years? Uh, well, it's been building up, it's been building up for you do the math. The, the Atlantic Ocean, at one time Africa, was smashed up against the coast of New England. It's now 3,000 miles away at an inch a year. <laughs> so you can see how long. And the Mariana Trench has been taking up the slack on the other side at least that long. So that's, yes, it's probably been around millions of years, sir. And I'm sorry, guys, I just want to lead up to that. Is oh. that you were saying that that's what's heating up the ocean waters, the Mariana's Trench, the, the volcanic action? No, no, no. I'm saying that the, the volcanic action underneath the, underneath the uh, uh, mantle is causing this, which who knows why it's happening, but it is happening indeed. And the ocean is actually heating up from the bottom up. Now, I didn't discover that. Someone else did. <laughs> But, uh, but that tells you a story. It's like putting a pot on the, on the stove. Eventually, it'll all get hot, but it starts at the bottom. That's the best explanation I have for you. But it's not just a trench. That's adding CO2 to the, uh, to the atmosphere, but uh, uh, probably not 300 uh, billion tons like they say, because the water will absorb probably a third of that. It's, it's a great holding device until it heats up, and then it doesn't hold near as much. That's the point it's trying to make. Right. Uh, have we gone through a few ice ages in this few? Uh, we've had at least five that they think of. Right. They think. They're not sure of that because so much evidence is lost as each one passes through. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, they figure at least five in, in the uh, several billion years that uh, it was possible. But now the mantle is heating up the water now when it, it didn't before. Well, the water's heating up now, but I, I have to remind you that uh, Back in without the Gulf Stream, when there was no uh, Mexico and there was an opening between the Pacific and the Atlantic, 
uh, the end result was the Arctic Ocean melted and it raised the levels of the sea. Uh, it stayed warm for a great long period of time, and that was only 75,000 years ago. To go back further than that, I have no inkling because there's, there's no subjective evidence. So, I'll leave it at that. Sir? Uh, maybe I, I missed your, your, your train of thought, but at what point and what, at what cause did the, from what you were saying, an event that would basically shear the, the mountains, and I don't know how tall the mountains that was, that was, were at the time, but... Velikovsky, Velikovsky yeah. lays that blame on the, the change in the magnetic fields when the planet Venus... Now, I, Venus I understand the change.